community. And she's here today to talk to us about secular groups in the community. What's in it for me? Please join me in welcoming Jeff Dubin. Thanks. Um, since atheists don't eat babies, is there any way I could convince people to come up a little closer to the front? Sure. If you don't mind. I don't need college students either. Cool. So um, I'm real discussion oriented, so if anyone wants to break in as I'm talking, wave your hand or just interrupt. I won't even be offended. Um, but um, first of all, I just want to say I really love to go to an event like this and see an event like this. Um, Secular student, and, uh, Secular student Alliance and I go back a long way. Um, I was on the board of SSA for six years. Um, during that time, we hired our first ever paid staff person. We hired our second paid staff person, who was August Brunsman. Um, we went from working out of people's apartments to having an office, had conferences, one of which had 20-something people show up. So, you know. It came a long way, and it was really exciting for me. And when I left the board after six years and saw you know, where SSA was going, I felt great. Um, today, I'm proud to be a monthly donor to SSA and proud to help out you know, any way I can. So it's like, even if I was just here as an attendee, just catching an hour of this, I'd be happy. Um, how many people, anyone know what the attendance is? How many people are at this? 300, that's, that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, want to find out a little bit about you guys. And sometimes at a, a speech or an event, when you ask people to raise their hands, you'll ask like a yes or no question, and then there's like three raised hands for yes and two for no, and a bunch of people that don't raise at all. So let's do a little practice. Um, how many people here are currently attending the Secular Student Alliance Conference? <laughs> Please raise your hand if that's the case. If not, then if, if you don't raise your hand, then you need more help than I can offer. I mean, I'm a clinical social worker, but still. Um, OK, good. So um, we talk a little bit about off-campus groups. Um, mine is the Humanist Community of Central Ohio. Um, there's others, whether they call themselves atheist, free thinker, humanist, skeptic, just any local organization which is not affiliated with a college or university. Um, how many people here, raise your hand, have attended a meeting or event of an off-campus group already? Wow, easy audience. Um, how many have never attended one? Not sure? I'm not sure. OK, OK. There have been a lot of things, but I'm not. OK. <laughs> um, how many people know of an off-campus group that exists in your area, in the area where you live? What, what groups are those? Can anyone tell me? I don't care. Atlanta Skeptics. That's different. There's a few in uh, southern Indiana. Really? In southern Indiana, huh? Yeah, yeah. And there's at least 12 atheists in Bedford, Indiana. Wow. Because <laughs> I'm from Indianapolis, and if you talk about anything south of Indianapolis, you know, we just thought it was, you know, Hicksville and. It's still I mean, there's some people that have been leaving Christianity. That's cool. Um, then um, how many people plan to take part in um, a local atheist or humanist organization uh, after you leave college or grad school or whatever you're in? Okay. Um, how many are not sure if you plan to or not? How many do not, like definitely do not plan to? Like uh, you won't be caught dead in there. Okay. So I mean, this is such an easy audience that, you know, because it's funny. You know, one thing I wonder when I do something like this is I ask myself, what are, what are off-campus groups not doing right? Because a lot of time, like my organization, uh, the Humanist Community of Central Ohio, a lot of time does not have any college students or even recent college students who are coming. And I don't know the stats, but in a very general sense, you know, you have like a lot of people obviously involved in college free thought. You have a lot of people uh, my age, which is 35 and beyond, 
involved in off-campus free thought, and not a lot of 25 or 30 year old people um, involved in, well, off-campus free thought. So, and I actually kind of have a sense of why based on my own experience. So, um, I was in grad school here at OSU, and I was involved in Students for Free Thought, which is now called SSA at OSU. And um, with a few friends, I went to some meetings of the Humanist Community of Central Ohio. This is maybe circa 2002, um, 2001, 2002, thereabouts. So here's the experience we had. Um, we went to these meetings, and the organization met at BC Roosters in the back room of this, basically a sports bar that sold a lot of chicken wings. And so um, here we are in the back room of the sports bar. Um, it's Saturday. Uh, there's college football games going on. People are sitting at the bar, talking and laughing at the football games. And then here is the bathroom. There couldn't be anything possibly go wrong with this idea, could there? So, you know, people make noise walking by, make noise walking back. And, you know, speaker gets interrupted. Uh, waiters and waitresses come in and refill people's drinks and serve them food and ask them if they want anything and so forth. Um, you know, meanwhile, and I wouldn't want to have caused any offense to people who were involved back then, but like a lot of the presentations were not that great. I mean, a lot of the time there were people who would like take up the whole two hours speaking and there was no time for Q&A. Um, there were people that just weren't boring, weren't that interesting. So after a few months off and on, I stopped going. Um, anyone else had that experience, gone to an off-campus group and it just wasn't that interesting? Uh, anyone feel comfortable telling us about? You know, you don't have to say where it was or anything specific, but just what did not hit the spot? Because I mean, I as a president of a humanist group would like to know. Shoot. There's a group that I went to in the San Francisco Bay Area that um, as an outsider, very insular, like it was, seemed like everyone was kind of friends, it was always the same people going to meetings, so it, it could be a little rough breaking into that if you're a shy person. Okay, okay. It's been really awkward trying to talk across a generational differences. So our, our off-campus group for a while was definitely like older individuals, not just adults, but much older, much, much older. Much, much. So on that note, I want to like talk a little bit about what my organization, the Humanist Community of Central Ohio, has done. Because um, after a while I came back, I had some friends who were involved to some extent. Um, someone asked me to be on the board. And I was on the board and like just we started adding more events. And of course also getting, getting known on, online and so forth. And people started coming. So just fast way forward to the present day. Um, most of our board of trustees is under 40. Um, if they're over 40, they're cool people under 40. <laughs> um, if they're over 60, they're still cool people under 40. Didn't happen overnight, took time. It took people not giving up. It took people coming. It took people starting things. And this is the model that we have. And I hope that you can convince your local groups to do the same thing. Um, What's a hobby that someone here has? Something that you enjoy doing? Watching movies. Okay, cool example. Um, if you were here in Columbus and you came to HCCO, you could start a movie appreciation club within HCCO. You could use our Facebook, use our meetup, use our meetings, invite people, you know, make sure that these people see the cool movies that they've probably never seen that you have. What else? Biking. Yep, we have a cycling event, not making this up. Um, we have a, a humanist cycling event. Um, I've discovered things I didn't even know I liked before. Um, someone came from out of town and she really enjoyed kayaking. So she started the kayaking. You know, now every so often we have kayaking. Um, so I guess a lot of the point I'm coming to is if your local group doesn't have what you're looking for, please don't give up on them. Because if you do, they continue not having what you're looking for. And then they don't have what the next person is looking for either. If the local group doesn't have what you're looking for, 
show up, introduce yourself, and ask if under its auspices, is that a word? Auspices? Yeah. Um, thanks. If under its auspices, if you can start that thing, you know, and you may find, not only may you find that they're enthusiastic, but you f may find that it changes the character of that group. Um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, game night. We actually have a game night once a month, but then someone also had an adult game night because the regular game night is family oriented. And anyone ever played Cards Against Humanity? Yeah. yeah, that wouldn't really be suitable for the kids running around version of the game night. So if someone had an adult game night, we could play Cards Against Humanity, you know. Um, you know, there's, there's a discussions. We have educational stuff, um, but we have a lot of fun stuff, and we've had a lot of service stuff as well. And, you know, that's my main interest is, like, don't give up on your off-campus group offering what you need, you know, because then they won't offer what, what the next person needs either. You know, go there and make it happen. Go there and ask for it. Go there and find out what they're doing. Um, maybe they don't think they can do more than they've done. Like, maybe they think that all we know how to do is to sit and talk about, you know, I don't know, what do what the old folks talk about at the one that? Uh, yeah. Hmm. And they have a homeschooling background too, um, lingering pseudo-scientific beliefs. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, kinds of interesting things going on. She was on Little Legs and I wasn't hanging with that group. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's the, I, I encountered that as well at 35. Go ahead. We, we have a really active group um, and there's a, a group that meets every Sunday uh, and it encompasses the same age group we're talking about here from, you know, 20s to retired to retirees and uh, what they do is uh, it's more of a, a book club mm -hmm. so it's not a book club it, but it, they have a book which is like the focus for discussion and it often goes off onto tangents and, and leads to good discussions and I don't see that age difference as being a problem at all. Good. And what do you think it is about that, that causes that not to happen? What do you think prevents that age difference from being a thing? Because we're all here ultimately for the same purpose. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's, a, it's a sense of community. Right. And, and that's what I keep on feeling. And I mean, I have found when I was a college student that I would go to even a national event, like um, in, in Boston, there was this Harvard Humanist event uh, a number of years back. And I would find when I would meet people who were 20, 30 years older than myself. It was not like people from my hometown that were 20, 30 years older than myself. They respected me. They listened to what I had to say. And, you know, I think you will find, even if in a certain group at a certain time you don't find that, in the whole in this movement you will. Um, has anyone heard? There's a couple of phrases I heard when I was, um, oh, there it is. Um, I was tabling at uh, ComFest, which is local free festival, and I heard a few phrases as I was speaking to people about HCCO. And raise your hand if you've heard people say this when you're talking to them about uh, free thought or secularism. I'm not a joiner. I don't like to join things. Anyone heard people say that? OK. I don't like labels. Don't label me. OK, people have heard that. Um, I don't label me. I don't fit into any one category. Anyone ever said that yourself? Okay, and, and here's the problem. Here's the problem that which I see is that if we say that and we assume that it means I'm just going to do my own thing, we lose and religion wins. You know, I mean, while we say I'm not a joiner, don't label me, mega churches have 3,000 people and offer everything people are looking for. You know, if we don't offer what people in their 20s need, the mega church will. If we don't offer the kayaking, the book club, the movie club, whatever, the megachurch will. 
in some places, atheists will go there. I'm serious. Like, I know atheists that go to church. Synagogue, obviously. You know, so we have to make the effort to offer these things and to kind of say, well, you know, you're not a joiner and you don't like labels, and I'm kind of like that too, but, you know, you should still check this out. Um, what do you... What do you, as a student, recent student involved in the student movement, want from an off-campus group? Shoot. Money. Money would be nice, yes. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, outside community members that can end up giving money. Cool, and I was just thinking about that as I was preparing this. And I was thinking, like, let's say you came to my organization. You would have a hard time like getting money from my organization as such. Like we might co-sponsor an event, but we're kind of scraping by. We recently hired a paid staff person, well, recently like a year and a half ago, but we're fundraising and trying to keep them employed. So it's unlikely that we would like write you a big old check from our bank account. However, here's what I could see happening, and I think you already kind of get this, is that if you were to come to, you know, our events and say, Hey, I've got this, what's your group called? Your student group? Cool. So if you said, hey, you know, SSA Chicago is doing this, this, and this, come check us out. People would come. I know that back when I was involved in SSA at OSU, a lot of people who were not students would come because it was cool, it was fun. Um, get to know those people. Some of them will have more money. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to say, you know, Jeff Dubin, we're really trying hard to do such and such. And we've already raised such and such, but we need so and so. And can you give us 500 bucks to help make this happen? You know, because you, you already hit it on the head. Like, there are people who have more money. You know, invite them. Let them know they're welcome. And some of them will be flattered and they'll come. Anything else that you need from an off campus group? My experience with the uh, with Atlanta Skeptics is that they they put on I think like a not not exactly a conference but they put on like a, a like a day event you know in Atlanta and that, it, that seems like a, you know a, like a larger thing that I don't know if a student organization can always pull off especially off campus and so they can it seems like they have kind of uh, fewer restrictions I guess and can maybe do more outside of the of the school. Yeah, and we've done some of that stuff. We actually uh, last year we had um, a summer solstice picnic. And it wasn't a conference per se, you know, but had various fun events. We do a um, winter banquet. And, you know, we do, and I hope other organizations do this as well. If not, refer them to me and I'll kick them in the butt. Um, we offer a discount. Anything we do that costs anything. You know, a generous discount to students or even a full scholarship. Um, if you know someone that leads an off-campus group and they're not doing some of these things and they don't think they can, you know, put them in touch with Jeff Dubin at the Humanist Community of Central Ohio. I'll do what I can talk them into it. Any other comments, questions, ideas? Uh, as, a, as a student organization, um, like I said, I've got the, the cooperative uh, community group. Where do I draw the line between uh, getting those people to come to our events and getting students to come to our events. Um, You're worried that I, I if really you get them to come to your events... My, my focus, uh, what, what I want to do is to get more students involved. Uh huh. But it's real easy for me to put an event up, like I can put an event up on their meetup and say SSA is doing such and such and I'll get, you know, maybe half a dozen people who aren't really involved with the, with the college. So. I'm not totally understanding the problem. It's like, 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 like ha is there a line between having events only for students and opening events up to the public? I, guess? I feel like in my time at um, what was then Students of Free Thought, what's now SSA at OSU, I feel like welcoming non-students was not a problem. And of course your mileage, yeah. your mileage may vary, but I always felt like, I mean, whether I was a student or whether I was involved as a non-student, I never, f I mean, 
I always felt like non-students actually added to it. I mean, I felt like, and sometimes, you know, you mentioned money. It's like, even if you don't necessarily kick in money, maybe that person who has been out of school for a while has, like, a nice house and will invite folks over for a cookout. You know, will come and give you a ride to this event, has certain resources available to them that you don't. Um, so I wouldn't be afraid of that. Now, that being said, there was one time when there was a non-student who had come who had really poor social skills, and there was a little male-female creepiness going on. But the reality is that could happen with students, too. Well, uh, so one of the problems there is viability issues. Uh, when you invite somebody on campus, or even as part of a campus group, start to go to somebody else's house who's not affiliated with the campus, mm -hmm. um, if the college found out about that, they would have serious liability issues, and they probably would have stopped that pretty quick. Good point. See, for some reason, I mean, maybe OSU being a public university, I never heard of anyone being told that non-students couldn't come to events. Um, with regard well, to the... So events are a different story, but I'm talking about just general practices, uh -huh. especially if it's sort of at a private home. Okay, so maybe in that case, you're right. Maybe in that case, you have to say, you can invite people, but this is not an official event mm -hmm. of the University of Blank Atheists and Freethinkers. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, you just, it's just social and it's not an official event, so you're absolutely right. There are also issues, uh, like we've had, uh, often student groups are set up much easier to run an event. They have easy access to space, easy access to some money. Mm -hmm. We've had non-student um, people who wanted to organize an event and said, will you sponsor my event? I have everything set up, ready to go. And maybe they don't follow things up, or maybe they take it too far. And sometimes there are difficulties set up, but sometimes they can bring a lot to the table that student groups then don't have to do as much work. Uh, so I think sometimes just anticipating that it could be a problem mm. give you just, you know, in case there's a problem, you can start to pull back. So as long as student groups are aware and, and know that they have the opportunity to say students only at any time. Right. They can be open to things while still letting non-students know, you know, you're welcome for now, but this is intended to be a group for students. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Well, appreciate your time. And like I said, I really enjoy being here.